In today's macro photography video, we're back at the School of Life Sciences at Nottingham University because we've got a bit of a challenge ahead of us. I want to photograph some strange and weird and wonderful stuff inside jars. Stick around and I'll explain more in just a sec. Hi guys, I'm Ben from Adapt Looks, and welcome back to another macro photography tutorial where today we're taking a look at some of the fascinating subjects preserved inside glass and plastic containers here at Nottingham University. The subjects themselves are going to be really interesting, especially up close, but today's tutorial is actually going to be about a particular technique. Because all of these um, strange, weird and wonderful preserved specimens are behind a reflective glass or plastic surface, that presents a huge challenge for us as photographers. So today's question is going to be, how do we photograph a subject that is behind a reflective glass surface? As you can see from the shelf behind me, there's a wide selection of all sorts of different uh, specimens, animals, insects, all sorts preserved within jars. Now they're mostly preserved inside fluids, which means that they're going to be quite tricky to take out of the jars and photograph, but we're going to do our best to get past all of that and get some macro photos of the subjects inside. Hopefully uh, we're going to be able to counteract any reflections and particles on the surface of the glass and get a nice clear photo of what's inside. So I've just grabbed Tom from the university. Tom, uh, reminders of your role here. So I'm a member of staff at the University of Nottingham. I have particular responsibilities with my colleagues for the master's course in biological photography and imaging. But I'm here today to talk a little bit about our fluid preserved specimens. Which is really handy because I don't really know all that much about why these things are preserved in the way that they are. Could you tell us a little bit about why they're bottled in fluids? Yes, so there are, when, you, when you're creating a museum of natural history objects, the large things with a good thick skin and a skeleton, you can prepare taxidermy, you can make skeletons, you can have them mounted or in just a series of bones. With the dried specimens like crustaceans and insects, you can pin them and have them arranged in drawers, as we've seen on your previous video. But when you've got soft-bodied creatures or things that you can't preserve in any way, such as these uh, caterpillars from uh, the puss moth, you're left with very few options. There is no other way of preserving them and, and using them for, for teaching and education other than preserving them. And there's kind of a two-step process. So normally you'd preserve them in a fixative like uh, formalin or formaldehyde, and then you'd preserve them in alcohol. But it depends on what you're storing them in. And I think that brings us on to your yes. topic, which is why we've got things in jars. And all the different varieties and shapes and sizes of these sure. jars. And so sometimes these become the object of what people want to take pictures of. So this is a, a Kilner jar from before the Second World War. It's uh, rusted, but it's still got its seal. That's the important mm. thing. Um, but other times you have, uh, this is an old coffee jar with a albino mole in it. We don't have any information as to why it's in a, <laughs> a coffee jar Maybe or just... why they wanted the mole preserved rather than yeah, uh, taxidermied. But sometimes you do this because you want to have a look at the insides later on. Another reason that we preserve things is that you can do dissections. So in this particular um, jar, which is a perspex jar, we've got a dissected shark's egg with the baby shark with its yolk sac visible inside. And there are other things you can do for teaching. So for instance, in this one, which is a shark's head, nose pointing upwards, um, as it was dissected, so they injected a dye into the heart and pushed that so it went through the gills. So you've got a nice clear image of where the heart and the gills are in this particular fish. I mean, it's all certainly quite strange, but strangely beautiful in, in uh, the same way. Um, so 
I'd like to try and capture some of that beauty and some of the uh, details on some of these subjects despite that glass. So the first challenge today is going to be photographing this shark, the dissected shark with the uh, dyed gills and heart here. This is inside a flat plastic case, but we're still getting a lot of reflections. As you can see, the reflections of the diffusers here. Um, and it's all going to be down to the placement of our camera and our lighting as to whether or not we can get rid of all of those reflections while still illuminating the subject underneath. So my setup today is a Canon 5D and I've got a reverse lens setup here which uh, has some extension tubes in the middle. This is a really nice cheap setup for a lot of magnification. Uh, as you can see we're getting really really close to those gills which is going to be fantastic. I'm also set up on a tripod with a focus stacking rail because when we get this close we're going to have a very shallow depth of field and a little bit of focus stacking should bring everything nicely into focus. Now let's talk about the lighting just for a moment. We've got the Adapts Look Studio control pod here on a miniature tripod and two white lighting arms reaching all the way down uh, around the front and then pointing down towards our subject. Now the placement of these lights is really, really important for uh, eliminating the reflections on the front surface of this glass. Uh, because uh, the glass is flat, uh, anything pointing in from the sides will reflect directly back into the camera. However, if we're pointing down from the top, it's not going to reflect down into the lens. It'll actually uh, just reflect off down into the, the ground. And that's where this little black sheet comes in um, because the table here is white. We don't want any light then reflecting back up onto this glass surface. Uh, so controlling your light is really important. And I'm going to be shooting in the complete darkness because uh, if you find the uh, the lights in here, I'm not sure if we can find the, uh, the roof lights, but you can see that there's a few extra little reflections appearing here from all of the different light sources in the room. So it's really important to turn off all of the lights and uh, only have light sources uh, that you're actually in control of reflecting on the glass surface. Uh, that uh, all in all should uh, reduce any reflections on the uh, the surface of the glass here and leave us just with the subject nicely in focus with no distractions to uh, get in the way. I really can't overstate how fascinating some of these subjects are. When you get really close in, uh, you start to see a lot of details that are kind of hidden to the naked eye when you're just looking around it because there's so much going on uh, because of that glass, there's labels on the glass, and of course there's all of that sediment and pigment moving around inside. Uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming to just pick up a jar and try and figure out what's inside. However, when you take the time to get a, a good composition of the interesting parts of the insect or animal or uh, whatever is inside your jar, it can make sure that you get a really good idea of the details that are hiding within. For example, um, it's really obvious that we're shooting a, a squid or an octopus inside one of these glass um, containers when you get some of those suckers on the tentacles in the frame. It's really unmistakable when those things are large and they fill the frame, whereas when you're looking at it in real life, you have to sort of move everything around, figure out what parts are what, and it doesn't really look like a real thing anymore. Um, however, having things suspended in uh, fluid, it certainly does make sure that all of those details are preserved just like they should be and it does allow us to get close in like this providing you have the control over the light to reduce the reflections on the outside of the container. Shooting against a flat reflective surface like this one uh, it's actually really easy to not get any reflections in your image at all. What's a little bit less easy is making sure that the glass is completely clean because any um, smudges or fingerprints on the front of the glass will probably get in the way and show up in your images. So do make sure to give any surfaces a really good clean before you start shooting through them. 
What's a little bit more difficult is a curved glass surface. Curved glass like this is going to pick up all of the reflections from a much wider range of angles. You can see on this glass that my two video lights here are reflecting already, but also all of the roof lights are reflecting on the curved areas of the glass. So this is going to pick up a lot more reflections, but we should still be able to eliminate them by using that top-down lighting technique and taking control of all of the lights in our environment. So taking a look at our uh, octopus here uh, found by the bus stop, it's actually in a cylindrical container. So there's a lot of extra reflections. It's very hard to find a spot that doesn't reflect those lights. The first thing I've done is just grabbed a lens cloth and wiped off the front of the glass surface as much as I can. Um, there's actually uh, quite a lot of um, floating debris and uh, sediment inside these bottles, so it's definitely worthwhile trying to not move things around as much as possible if you are shooting something that is tending to be sat still for a long time. Now you can see uh, on my image here, we actually have a huge reflection of one of these two diffusers, but to solve that problem, all I need to do is find a spot that uh, is lighting the subject, but not reflecting in the glass. So uh, for a subject like this, that's actually um, about 45 degree angle downwards, um, but not too far away from the glass. The further away from the glass that you get, the more likely it is going to reflect back into the lens. So keeping everything nice and close together with a dedicated macro light source like this, really helps to control all of those reflections and give you a clear view through to the subject inside. I think one of the most interesting things that I photographed today is uh, this <laughs> jar of assorted reptiles. Uh, it's in alcohol and there's just a whole mess of tails and feet and uh, little legs uh, going on inside this jar. It's uh, a really eclectic mix of strange scales and things on the inside of this jar. However, it's got this sort of dark pigmented water. So um, it's actually really interesting to have the light drop off very quickly as it enters this, uh, this murky brown fluid, um, leaving only the highlights of the things that are closest to the surface. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to light, placing your light so that it falls on the areas that you want to be well lit, but uh, still being conscious of those reflections is a nice challenge, um, but the details in here are fantastic and quite honestly, I just like the idea of a, a jar of assorted reptiles. Uh, it sounds like something you'd get from the uh, candy shop or something like that, uh, although I'm sure that you won't want to eat any of these. When I was first taking a look at some of these jars and specimens, I was quite concerned that it would be very, very difficult to get photographs of what's inside. Those reflections can be really pesky, especially in strangely shaped jars with curves and all things like that. However, it turns out it is quite simple. All you need to do is place the light in the uh, correct place so that it's not reflecting back into the lens and then control your environment so that there's no errant reflections coming from windows or other light sources around your room. Uh, there's a few extra concerns like making sure that your white table is not reflecting back into the, uh, into the glass surface, but all of those are fairly quick fixes. When you uh, take a look in the back of the camera and there's a strange reflection that you don't recognize, you can quite easily move your hands around and block different areas of your image and track down where that reflection is coming from. So maybe it's reflecting off some of your camera equipment or the table, or maybe there's a little crack in a, uh, in a, in a, a window or something like that that's causing a reflection that you weren't expecting, and then you just need to fix that uh, source of light. So I'm pretty happy with the images that I've captured today. I'd like to know from you guys what you think to some of the strange, weird, and wonderful things that we've been photographing. So let me know down in the comments whether you want to see any more um, photography here at Nottingham University. There's a huge collection, a lot of really interesting things left to photograph. For now, that is all that I've got time for. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.